Last year saw some really impressive camera releases from the Canon R5C and the Fujifilm X2 and a host of other really great cameras as well. But one thing has always been really difficult to achieve, which is the perfect balance between being a great photo camera and an excellent video camera. In all the cameras released this year, with maybe the R6 II as an exception, there's most often a trade-off. And yes, for many years, most cameras have been able to take great stills or videos, but it doesn't mean that they're equally easy to use in both of those modes. That is, until the new Panasonic S5 II dropped in my lap. Panasonic really already had one of the best video-centric interfaces of any mirrorless camera. In previous cameras, they've had some incredible features, but was also subject to trade-offs. After two weeks of using the S5 II, I can say with a very great degree of certainty that this is the first camera body that I've used that is equally excellent in both situations and comes with some really special and unique upgrades. And yes, there of course are some trade-offs and we'll talk about those, but they may or may not be relevant to you. So let's get into it. As with all my videos, I'm gonna walk you through the highlight reel of what I love about this camera, and then we're gonna wrap up with some of those trade-offs that you may have to consider. So first things first, let's just speak to the interface. The challenge that I have with most mirrorless camera interfaces is when it comes to video. They are still fundamentally set up for photo shooting, whereas dedicated video cameras often have a very well set up user interface that allows for quick changes and operation. Most mirrorless cameras still require you to dig into the menu or the queue menu, which often slows me down and I spend so much time asking myself, uh, where was that thing again? I can't find it. And that's with cameras I already own, so or cameras that I've owned for a long time. And that's a huge frustration for me when I don't experience that at all when I'm working with cinema cameras. My favorite thing about Panasonic is their heads up touch display, just like on their cinema cameras. And this allows me to see and operate everything that I need very quickly. Panasonic continues to be one of the very few brands to offer pro video tools like shutter angle and scopes, making it really operate like a proper cinema camera. The camera also features four channels of audio and users can get the hot shoe audio interface and take full advantage of this feature. Their direct competitor is the R6 II. And considering that the S5 II is much easier to use in video mode, in addition, it has a full-size HDMI versus the R6-2's micro HDMI. So another huge win for the S5-2. The camera has as good of heat management as the S1-H or the R5-C without that bulky back fan and instead intelligently hides the fan above the lens mount. Since I'm more of a videographer than a photographer, I set up the custom function dial to various frame rates being 48, 60 frames per second, another one in a high frame rate mode. Now, you could choose to say make one 6K or another one shooting V-Log and then another shooting say a custom look. Now, this is not at all unique to this camera as all cameras have custom function setups. I'm just saying that it really completes the setup allowing for rapid changes and effortlessly moving from photo to video. Okay, let's do some video. And to demonstrate this, I used this camera recently on a studio fashion editorial. I never struggled with this camera at all during the shoot, which take my word for it, is an anomaly for me. And that was even more important on the day because we really only had about four hours to get photos and videos, three separate sort of looks. So if a camera slowed me down at all, it could have really cost us the day. So we're here at Sori Studios in Toronto, good friends of ours. What we're gonna do today in this studio is we've got a white scene and then gonna have a dark scene. We're trying to keep it as simple as possible. We only have about four hours here in the studio. So we're gonna try to shoot video and photo at the same time in those four hours with two different looks. Try to give two products and I think that's what we're trying to show with this camera is that it's really great in both of those modes and you can flip back and forth really quickly making a really useful tool for content creators. We're gonna start with photos today because our model Ailish is looking really amazing and before her hair gets all messed up with video and wind and everything, we're gonna snap those photos first and then move into video. So it should be a super fun day and uh, let's rock and roll. I'm sure that you want to see what we created in our very short time in the studio. So I'm going to play the 30 second video first and discuss the video quality after. And then after that, we're going to discuss the photo experience. So let's roll the tape.
Now, in terms of image quality, Panasonic has always been a very polarizing brand for me. As a former GH model owner, to be honest, I've never really liked the color science that came out of those Micro Four Third cameras. Even the GH6, I'm still not a big fan of. However, the S1H and their video cameras have always been a favorite of mine. And with those cameras, the color science is beautiful, as is with the S5 II. However, I do find these cameras to lean a little bit to the magenta and higher saturation. I don't particularly like that, but I know that I can easily tease this out in post, leaving me with a very pleasant and satisfying skin tone. There are a few handicaps with this camera when it comes to video functionality that's worth mentioning now while we are simply on the subject. There is no 120p at 4K, and if you want to shoot 48 or 60 frames per second in 422 10-bit, well, you're gonna end up with a crop sensor. For full sensor performance, you can still have 10-bit, but your chroma is now shifted to 420. Now, the big question, of course, does this matter? And I'm not particularly sure that it does. Here are two examples. Can you tell which is the 422 and which is the 420? YouTube compression likely makes this completely irrelevant, but isn't that sort of the point since 90% of what creators will use this camera for will end up online anyways? Additionally, I can tell you that with my own eyes, with the original footage, I could not really perceive a difference. Even in the grade, I could only tell the slightest of differences. This is all by design as well, as Panasonic will be releasing a more video-focused model later this spring, which will include external raw video data output, higher bit rates, and internal ProRes recording. However, those frame rates and resolutions will remain the same. The photo experience was equally as good, and even though I didn't have the ability to edit the raw photos in post, because it's a pre-production camera, Working from the JPEGs did not at all feel restrictive. Great skin tones and detail that really allowed me to do some really fun compositing and retouching without things getting at all too messy. The one comment I made to Panasonic was the omission of HEIF files, which are really becoming quite common among new camera releases and offer 10-bit over the latitude of an 8-bit JPEG. However, it's clear that perhaps it's not as important as I'd like to believe. There are two features on this camera that are absolutely outstanding. Hear me out. The first being autofocus. I've been taken to the executioner a few times by our viewers over my thoughts on autofocus. Most often, I don't pixel peep when it comes to autofocus. So yes, I have missed some micropulsing and other autofocus issues from cameras in the past, giving perhaps a more glowing review than was likely warranted. So I made absolutely sure to throw everything at this camera. I simply really never expect any brand to be as good as Canon or Sony when it comes to autofocus. However, the S5 II is the very first other brand that has accomplished autofocus with as much power and precision as those aforementioned brands. More so, when I compared it to the R5C, it noticeably outperformed the R5C. The S5 locked on sooner for longer and while obscured by a window, which the R5C could not at all resolve. When it comes to micropulses, there were simply none that I could perceive. The one important caveat is that of autofocus across the board is also lens dependent, where linear or zoom lenses will often perform better. When shooting our model in studio, I did have to change the settings to be a little bit snappier. We're gonna do it again, I'm gonna just change my autofocus settings. But it never dropped our model. If this doesn't excite Panasonic fans, man, I don't know what to tell you because this is mega, mega, mega. Number two exciting feature is the real-time LUT. On the surface level, this simply allows you to burn any custom LUT you make versus having to apply it in post. So, for example, those shooting for a quick turnaround and no post resources will definitely appreciate this. However, this means that this camera can do what no other camera can currently do, to my knowledge, which is allowing you to build a completely custom look for your photos. Let me show you what that looks like. Normally, most cameras, most notably Fujifilm, come with a variety of picture profiles or film simulations. They can be tweaked to your liking, but the tweaking is limited. Thus, when I'm shooting photos, I have to just pick the profile that is most neutral or closest to the way that I like to shoot, knowing that I will radically change the image in post when working from the raw image. With all other cameras, there is no way for me to shoot photos with an actual image 
that most closely resembles the way that I edit. With the real-time LUT, I can take my custom base look in Lightroom and then export that as a cube file. I will put a link to how to do this in the description below. And then what I do is I save it to the now expanded LUT library and then add that to the real-time LUT. Now I'm shooting and composing based on how I know I will likely edit the final photo. Or if it looks good enough to me out of the camera, I can just immediately upload it and maintain my look with no editing. This is genius and I have no idea why it took a camera brand this long to create this feature. Let's now talk about the camera's image stability. Overall, very good IBIS. An image can be reliably handheld to one fifth of a second, but of course, this is all lens focal length dependent. When it comes to video, and I think this is most relevant to vloggers, the basic stability offers what I feel is the best performance. Any of the boosted modes add really too much artificial wobble in the corners for my liking, and nothing really still matches having the IBIS turned off while using a gimbal. Now the boosted IBIS functions are also use dependent, performing better under certain conditions than others. So for me, the value is always in the rolling shutter performance. If it's low enough, then handheld can look organic and interesting. The rolling shutter of the S5 II isn't the best, but it's only minutely worse than the R5C, which has an already low rolling shutter of 11.5 milliseconds. Though there are a few other full frame cameras on the market that beat this, but often at a considerable price increase. So for me, it's a pretty good trade-off. While we're on the subject of trade-off, let's discuss the challenges I have with this camera. And to be honest, there aren't many. I've mentioned the frame rate trade-offs, but again, for the price and who this camera is marketed to, I think those are perfectly acceptable trade-offs. There was only really one challenging feature, and I simply just don't love how Panasonic lays out their frame rates and bit depths. It's just a barfing of options that aren't categorized at all. I get that this is a personal preference, but even when I owned a GH camera, I hated this. Everyone does this better. A simple filter by type would make this so much less overwhelming and confusing. In the same tone, their menu remains a bit scattered as well. There are some features that are in random places that should otherwise, in my mind, be grouped together. The workaround, of course, with all cameras, is to utilize the custom menus. I'd like to wrap up by just saying, it's sort of strange to me to have so little negative things to say about a camera. If we consider the retail price of this camera and what it offers, I think this camera is going to be a huge success for Panasonic in 2023. This is really an absolutely ideal camera for multidisciplinary creators. The only reason in my mind to choose a comparable product from another brand is preferences around color science or if you already have lenses in another brand's ecosystem. For those who work leans more heavily into video, well, I do kind of suggest that you might want to wait out for the s 52 x Though if all you're really after is just raw recording, well, you can pay an extra $129 Canadian for the s 52 whereas that raw recording is included with the X version. And that is it for today. Thank you so much for watching. As always, please subscribe to this channel for more videos like this and comment in the comment section below. I'd love to hear what you have to say. Plus, you know, algorithm. For me, for now, for today, I'm out. Peace.